questions that are being asked I'd like to mostly address, so this is my preference, is questions that affect how you walk. Questions about living this out. What he's always told me is, tell them that if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, they'll be where they're supposed to be. But you need a teacher to teach you what it is you need to be doing. All right, so welcome to the Zone One meeting for the month of May. All right, so, Shamish Kurtmeyer. All right, this is from Adam. Uh, when the third temple is erected, will the males be required to attend the three pilgrimage feasts in Jerusalem? Um, okay, you guys right off the bat want to get me into eschatology. I see how. Uh, <laughs> All right, so we don't know in Scripture, you know, what's going to happen when they start to build something. The Ezekiel temple, okay, that being the real official third temple, will have us all going to Jerusalem. That's when it says that if the, if the nations don't come up to Jerusalem, they'll get the plagues of Egypt and that kind of thing. So, yes, that's the temple in the millennium, though. That's the correct actual temple, the Levites will be running it again, and it will all be under the guidance of our Messiah. So that temple, yes, we will still be doing Deuteronomy 16, 16, and three times a year, we will be pilgrimaging to Jerusalem as it says. That not, that's not to say that as soon as there is a temple sort of kind of working and functioning, because we need to have one for the uh, abomination of desolation and for some of the things that are supposed to happen in the end time. And so there has to be some place for that to happen. At least there needs to be an altar set up and working. But the question about the third temple, my answer would be yes, when we have that temple. Now, what should we do or what will we, will we be appropriately required to do or expected to do when they get the temple going at any level? I'm hoping that he will inspire those that he's put in place as to what to do when that happens. Because I'm not real clear yet what that, I mean, thankfully it hasn't happened yet, so we don't have to figure that out. But as soon as it does, I'm, I'm hoping for an answer to be given uh, to whoever needs to have it, you know, so uh, given to me, whatever, so that I can share that with you at that time. Okay, so hopefully that answered that question. All right, um, now we're, Keeping questions to those that aren't in a teaching already, or are you just going to address that? I mean, you can, you can, they can ask any questions. I was trying just okay. to let the people ask questions first that don't normally get to ask. Right. You know. From G. Ozzy, uh, can you have company during Shabbat, and what would that look like? Um, let's just remember with Shabbat that we want the Shabbat to be as vertically focused as possible. So there's nothing wrong with fellowshipping as opposed to having company with those that you're going to spend time focused vertically with. So having another, like a, a family of, of the brethren, you know, another family that's covenanted or at least covenant pursuant and, and trying to walk this out to come and spend time with you on Shabbat, provided that that's where your focus is gonna be. But as far as having company over, that sounds more socially just your friends and, and just hanging out. And the answer to that is no, okay? This is his day, not yours, and this day needs to be used to focus on that primarily and if not completely, okay? And so if you do have people over, make sure that you make the effort to keep the focus vertical because it's very easy for that to go sideways, all right? Next question. Ray Rachel White, if we miss Rosh Kodesh service, is that a sin? Okay. <laughs> no, don't laugh. These are good questions. All right, if you miss Rosh Kodesh service. All right, there is a need that's coming to be filled. Well, there's a need that I'm gonna to try to fill very soon here for teaching on what sin is and how sin is handled and that kind of thing. So we'll deal with that when I get to that teaching. But just to kind of put this forward, um, all sin is the same on at least one level. It's missing the mark on what he had intended you to do or not do. Okay, so from that point of view, yes. If he expects you to celebrate the new moons and you don't, then that would be missing the mark, okay? 
Now, that's not to say that if you can't show up or you get, something comes up where you're, under, you know, you're, you're not feeling well and that kind of thing, or there's not one near where you can go, but you, look, you can always do the online one. But I just think that that broader spectrum of what sin is, but you also got to de-escalate our, you know, panic about what sin is. I mean, because we're thinking maybe back when we were Christian, sin, when you sin, then you're going to go burn in hell forever or some other thing like that. That's not the way it works. Sin is where you still need to say, I have to go through the repentance process, right? You have to say, I'm sorry, I'm going to try not to do it again, and my intention is not to do it again, etc. All right? So it's missing the mark, okay? Keeping it as simple as I can. And if you miss the mark, that is a problem in your vertical relationship. And so sin, let's, uh, I might use that when I get to the sin teaching if I remember it. It's, it's something that damages or impedes the level of your vertical relationship. That's what sin is. It's doing something. It's not just doing something we would think of as evil, causing harm in some way, because it, it does hurt you. But do you understand what I'm saying? It's disappointing him. It's not what he intended. It's not what he wanted. It's not what he desired. You missed the mark. And so it's not the end of the world if you only do it the one time and repent or if you trip up at some point and you repent, but it's something that you need to take seriously that needs to be addressed, repented of, and fixed. All right? It's not to be taken lightly, but it's also not the end of the world. We all trip, all fall short, all sin, and we should have a strong desire to fix all those things and not keep doing them, right? Okay. So hopefully that answered that question. Next couple on Shabbat here um, from MTR Urbana. Someone in the congregation would like to know if it is permissible to visit someone in hospital on Shabbat. Okay. Let me, let me kind of make this simpler so we don't keep getting the same kind, you know, you know, kind or types of questions. Do not do, okay? Do not do anything on Shabbat. Um, this is not going to be limited to everything. I'm going to give you one guideline. Don't do anything on Shabbat you can do some other day. That doesn't mean you can do everything that has, that, that the only day to do it is Shabbat because you can't work your job, you can't do it. But I'm saying, but certainly, anything that you could do a different day, you should. So unless the person is like critical and dying, which I would then think it'd be appropriate to go and see them in the hospital, especially if it's a family member, that kind of thing, but if they're in the hospital and, and it seems like they're going to be reasonably okay, but they're going to have to stay there for a couple of days, so visit them on Sunday. Visit them on Monday. Don't visit them on Saturday. Let's understand that that's, because that's doing what you want to do that could be done on a different day. Okay? I will make a caveat when it comes to the hospital. If the person in the hospital is covenanted, in other words, they're part of the body, and they, want, they would like to have Sabbath fellowship in a right context, that would be fine. That would be a blessing, actually, for you to do that. Not just to visit a friend who keeps nothing and they're going to talk about whatever and, you know, and that kind of stuff. But if it's somebody who's Sabbath keeping and part of the effort to be covenanted and they really would desire some fellowship on Shabbat and you can come and give them appropriate Shabbat fellowship, Yes, I would be fine with that, okay? Because then it's something you couldn't do on a day other than Shabbat. You can't give them Sabbath fellowship on a different day, okay? So hopefully that, that it's a very nuanced sort of thing, okay? It really depends on these other aspects of the situation to really know the right answer. But the general parameters I want to give you going forward is anything you think to do and you say, is this okay on Shabbat? Well, it's not whether or not it's okay on Shabbat or not, but if you don't need to do it on Shabbat, you wouldn't be asking the question if you knew for sure it was good. So if there's any doubt, just do it a different day. Okay, if there's a doubt, then just do it a different day. And certainly you're always welcome to contact us and ask us for a halachic understanding of what would be appropriate or not. Okay. And by the way, sometimes don't get mad at me because I might, I might turn around and say, are you asking this question because you don't know? Because I may already know you well enough to know you know. Or are you asking hoping to get a different answer than you came up with yourself? Because I've had a few people ask me some Shabbat-related questions that I was really like, I was like, really? <laughs> Seriously? Because I knew them, and I knew they knew. So I'm like, you're really asking because you don't know or because you're hoping for something different? Because if it's hoping for something different, I'm not giving that to you anyway. But you already know, 
then you should just act with how you already know. Does that make sense? Okay, next question. All right, another Shabbat one you might have covered. I'm, it's going so fast I can't That's st okay. stick with what you're saying. And, all right, so if we run out of meds, can we pay for our way to get some on Shabbat? Also, is it right? Is it the right way to do Shabbat 6 to 6, 6 p.m. to 6 p.m., or sunset Friday to sunset Saturday? And can we use Google to judge timings? All right. There's like three questions in that, but we'll try to try to cover them as best I can remember them. All right, so the first question was about the medication. Part of our becoming Torah observant, Torah pursuant, in other words, submitting to the Father, is learning to arrange our lives around him and his things. That's a big part of it. It's kind of like I, t I talk to my teenagers that now that they're starting to work, I said, so one of the first things that you have to learn about work is planning and scheduling to show up. In other words, you have to know when you're supposed to be there. And so you have to arrange and plan for being there. Make sure that you're, if you have certain clothes to wear that they're washed and ready or that you have things set aside, that, you, that you're prepared to go to work. Well, the same thing with our relationship vertically. You have to be knowing that Sabbath is coming. You should be aware of your medication. You should be aware of anything that you might need, okay? Now, that being said, I want to please listen carefully to how I word this. If, like anything else where you make a mistake and it's something that you're sorry about and you're going to repent of, but you would be in a, in a dangerous health position and you ran out of medication, yes, you would go get it because you're in a dangerous health position, but you would repent of that and say, I'm going to make sure this doesn't happen again. Okay, this is your ox in a ditch. But don't just casually ignore your medication you know, status, how much you have as far, as far as that's concerned, figuring, hey, I can always just go get it. No. If it happens once, it should not happen twice. That once should be enough to get you to pay attention so it doesn't happen twice. By the way, this is not talking about things that it would be nice to have and it'd be, if it's okay for you to skip a day and nothing terrible would happen, then you skip a day. This is something that something really bad could happen if you didn't have your medication. And, if, and actually, if your life and death is that close to, you know, your physical health to that medication, how do you let it run out? How is that not a priority for you to make sure you don't run out? Okay? I mean, if it's that important, you should never run out. You should know exactly how much more you have. Make sure you're getting it a week or so in advance to make sure you don't run out. Most things that people take, they will give it to you, you know, well, like a week ahead of time so you don't run out, at least. They're not going to give it to you months in advance, like so much, but as you're getting close, you can go ahead and get that filled. So I got plenty, you have plenty of time to do this. So really the, the problem for you, who are the one who's asking the question is, you are just now aware of a weakness in your character and personality that needs to be worked on that you're not paying good enough attention to. I'm not picking on you. I'm not trying to be insulting. I'm saying this is good because now you can fix it. Okay? All of us have had things run out on Shabbat and almost all of it is stuff we could live without. And so that's not been a big deal. Although I remember years ago somebody telling me how they had to go get milk on Saturday morning because their kids woke up for breakfast and they didn't have any milk and they had forgotten to buy it. So then they said to me, well, that must be my ox in a ditch. I said, no. What does the ox in the ditch lesson tell you? It says, if you don't take the ox out of the ditch, it would break its leg, likely die. It would, it would be life and death. The kids won't starve to death without milk for cereal. Matter of fact, probably they'll like eating it dry anyway. You see them in the box, handfuls of it or whatever they're doing, right? I mean, they'll survive without milk. And let that be a lesson to you to pay better attention on Friday. You know, a commanded day is Shabbat. A hinted at day is the preparation day. It's not commanded, okay? But it's a day you're supposed to be double checking everything so Shabbat won't have a problem. So you should go through your refrigerator and go through your cabinets and go through your pantry and go through your medication, whatever you need to go through, make sure you have gas in your car or whatever it is that you need to do so that you don't have a problem. And I'm not picking on you guys saying like, like as if I can't have this problem. I almost ran out of gas about a month ago. 
Okay, I missed it on Friday, planned to get it, something came up, got distracted, showed up here with my car, you know, the cars now tell you how many miles you have left, I think I had seven. Which my house is probably just about that maybe, but then I still wouldn't make it back to a gas station. Now thankfully we had somebody in the congregation that actually had gas, like, you know, a spare little five gallons, whatever, and I was able to put a little bit in the car to get me there, until wait until I can get to the gas station. But the thing was, I made that mistake. Anybody can make the mistake, but you don't, I wasn't gonna go to the gas station, okay? On Shabbat, there's just no way. If anything, I would've waited till after sundown and then asked somebody to maybe go over and get me some and bring it for me or something, cause I, or take me over to get it, but there was no way I was going to go to the gas station on Shabbat. It wasn't life and death, it was just inconvenient, okay? We don't fix inconveniences on Shabbat. We suffer them so that we're motivated to fix them so they don't happen again. I'll say that again. Inconveniences on Shabbat are to motivate you to fix the problem so that you're not inconvenienced the next time. Because I promise you, I watch now very carefully how much gas is in my car Friday. Because I'm not gonna have that happen again. It brought something to my attention that I hadn't really been paying attention to. Okay? All right. The other parts of the question had to do with um, six to six and Google, right? Yeah, correct. Oh, good, I remembered. All right. Sabbath scripturally is sundown to sundown. Okay. And by the way, six to six is a kind of a generality that came up because in, in, in Jerusalem, a lot of times it is from six to six. The sundown is from six to six or whatever. But you know what? The way they did their time when they did you know, the third hour and the sixth hour or whatever it was, weren't necessarily hours the way we think of hours. Some of you are thinking, what? They took whatever daylight time was and broke it up into 12 segments. And so sometimes it was longer, sometimes it was a little shorter, depending on if it was in the winter or if it was in the summer. But they broke it up into 12 segments of time during the daylight time, okay? Now, so no, we do not do six to six unless it actually is sundown is six, okay? And it can be, because after all, where we live here, sundown gets as early as 4.30. So at some point it was a six. And then on the way back again towards eight or nine, it gets past six again. So sundown to sundown. Let me just kind of give a, the one places where this could be really challenging. What if you live really far north or south when the sun maybe almost doesn't go down or either almost doesn't come up because that happens when you get way north and way south. So what do you do when the sun goes down at 11 and comes back up at 12 and it's only been down for an hour? Okay. That's where I would say, let's pick a time to, that makes sense because you're living in an extreme place where the, the sun does those kind of things. And that would be something that we could, we could talk about, you know, make an adjustment to. Because that, now, bear in mind, even if you did sundown at 11 and then sun back up, you're still going to have exactly 24 hours till sundown again at 11. So you still have a 24-hour Sabbath, even if you did 11 to 11 p.m., I mean, right? So it's still going to be a 24-hour Sabbath. You're just going to have all of it dark or all of it daylight, pretty much. And that's not really relevant. It's about time, not whether or not it's dark. Is that fair? Okay. So if you live in an extreme place, contact us and we'll help you figure out what we would, you know, give a right ruling for as to how to handle that. Okay. Sundown at nine is not extreme. We're talking about places that have maybe, you know, an hour or two or less of sundown because they live way, way north or way, way south. All right. Then as far as Google, yes, Google generally will give you correct time if you go ahead and look that up. You know, a lot of the time when you put that in, in, in most browsers, you say sundown today in your town and it just pops up and tells you it's whatever time. Now, by the way, that sundown is not necessarily dark. That's when the sun went below the horizon. It could be very light still. My preference halachically is that you start your Sabbath when it says sundown, even though it's not dark yet and you finish it a little later when it actually is dark. So if it says sundown today is, I don't know, let's see what sundown today is. I'll tell you right off the phone here. Okay, so sundown today, my phone doesn't want to go to that screen. 
Okay, so on my phone it says sundown is 8.30. So I would start yesterday around 8.30. Okay, I, 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 don't, I don't do things generally near sundown to be paying that close attention on a Friday night because I'm already doing Sabbath things at that point. Because I'm doing f- almost Sabbath things starting maybe six o'clock on Friday because I'm already focused on getting ready for Shabbat as, as far as the teaching and those kind of things, right? So 8.30, but then today at 8.30, when it's sundown, it will still be light. I would say let's wait till about 8.45. Give it a good 10, 15 minutes and it will be dark, Okay. Because, you know, measuring and not knowing exactly when the sun will be mathematically going below the horizon, if you lived in the mountains, it gets dark differently than if you don't live in the mountains, it gets dark quicker, okay? And because of the angle and everything else. So it just really depends on where you are, okay? And which side of the mountain you're on and all these kind of things, right? So let's wait till it's actually dark outside to know the Sabbath is over and maybe start a little earlier. So you get 25 hours of Sabbath, who cares? And that, don't we want like 24 seven Sabbath anyway? Okay. So what's the big deal, you know, giving it an extra hour, all right? All right, next question. All right, um, Rabbi, you touched on the subject of mikvah declarations Tuesday night. My question is, a person has made those publicly, especially seven and eight, and they can choose to go back to whatever or some mixed mess, have they broken covenant? Okay, so the mikvah declarations are not the covenant. They are you making declarations that you understand the commitments of covenant that you're making in a public way. So you're committing to come out from the other authorities of the world and self, etc., and then you're committing to come under the authority of Elohim and Torah and that kind of stuff. The covenant is Exodus 19. You agree to do whatever he says. If you choose to stop doing whatever he says, you've broken covenant. You've also probably broken the mikvah declaration, but the declarations are not the covenant, Okay. They are a public declaration of your commitment to covenant in the context of those things so the public would know that you are now declaring out loud that covenantal commitment. You can make the covenantal commitment by yourself in your house, in your own room, anywhere. It means between you and the Father, we say, Father, I am now going to do whatever you say. Okay, you can do that. All we do with the declarations is make that public. Okay, so it's not the covenant itself. It's a public declaration that you're wanting, if you are committing to covenant. So if you go backwards or you sideways or whatever it is off the path of covenant into some sort of mixed mess, yes, you've broken covenant. And you need to fix that or else you can find yourself in, in some really deep stuff. I mean, you can be in you know, it's real trouble, okay? Next question. All right, so someone's asking if we have a teaching on transfusions or organ donation. Okay, I don't, but this does bring up, uh, we, we have talked about this in the past and made halachic uh, rulings on this. Okay, what needs to be understood is Deuteronomy 17. It talks about how there will be a body of authority, judges, kings, priests, whatever that, those judges, those stand, who stand before Yahweh to make decisions. Actually, let me just read it to you so you can understand. Belie- beginning in, um, let's see, verse 8. All right. When any matter arises which is too hard for you to judge. Now they give examples between blood and blood, plea and plea, stroke and stroke, whatever. Matters of strife within your gates. When there's something that you don't really know what to do. He says, then you're going to go bring this matter. So you're going to rise up and go to the place where Yahweh all him chooses. And then this is who you're going to go to. The priests, the Levites, or the judge. Those who in those days are standing before Yahweh to do his you know, do his, do his due diligence. This is verse 12. Let me read it in verse 12. To the person who stands to serve there before Yahweh or Elohim, or to the judge, etc. So you're looking to the leadership at the time who stands before Yahweh in a place of authority to represent Yahweh to the people. Now it says that when you go to that person, it says, and you come to the priest, etc., then they shall declare to you the word of right ruling, in other words, how to apply the Torah in that situation, and you shall do according to all that they declare to you from that place which Yahweh chooses, and you shall guard to do according to all that they instruct you. So now you're listening to that authority, human authority, who was put there by 
so they're anointed, they're appointed by the above, put there by Yahweh, to help you understand the nuances of, of the halachic interpretation of the law, how to, how to walk out the Torah. Because the Torah doesn't cover every specific thing that you can run into in detail. It covers everything in some aspect or some generalities, and some things are in detail, but some things it doesn't really cover in detail, especially considering that we live in a world very physically different than the world they lived in when they got these instructions. They didn't have electricity or cars or gas or refrigerators or any of these things that modern conveniences that we have. Internet, phones, okay? And so sometimes people wanna know, how do we still keep Sabbath under this condition or this situation, et cetera? How do I still eat right under this condition? How do I still, because we're dealing with stuff in a very different way now, all right? And so the key is that you then go to those, so this goes back to your role, your job, your main, your number one job, other than doing what he says, is to find you Ephesians 4 leadership. Okay, the five-fold leadership, because those are the people you go to for these answers. Those are people that are not just walking around in what looks like leadership, but are actually anointed and appointed from above. And how do you know? You pray and ask Abba to show you. you have to, it should be obvious. Just like in Yeshua's day, that when he spoke, the people said something different about this guy. He's speaking like somebody who has authority, which meant they felt he was at least a prophet. Because prophets had a level of authority you could hear from them when they spoke. Not because they carried themselves in a way that had authority. They had an anointing that when you heard them, you said, that person's got authority. That authority is coming from above. Well, some of you have heard people with authority and said that authority came from themselves. And you can hear the difference if you're listening. I mean, you might not always hear the difference because you're not paying attention enough. But you can hear it if you're looking for it. And so you go to this Deuteronomy 17 people or person, and then it says, and then you do according to the Torah in which they teach you, according to the right ruling which they say to you. You don't turn to the right or to the left from the word which they declare to you. And the man, if you don't do this, then you're acting arrogantly. He says, the man who acts arrogantly is to not listen to the person that just gave them that right ruling. The one who stands to serve there before Yahweh, that man shall die. Because this is evil. He says, this is how you purge evil from Israel. It's evil because it's causing suffering and harm if you don't listen. All right, that being said, all right, when you have something come up like transfusions, um, donating organs or receiving, you know, like for transplants, Scripture never talks about these things. So not directly, Right? So how do we apply these things? Now this brings me to why I believe at some point we will have, because we clearly need, to have a judging body, a bet din. Okay, big din means house of judging, okay? Or a Sanhedrin-like structure. I don't mean the Sanhedrin like the way the Jews necessarily had it and all the politics of it, but a Sanhedrin-like structure where there are those whose job it is to bring wisdom in and out of the abundance of wisdom, come up with a, an appropriate halachic interpretation of the circumstance that a person is facing. And then we would write that down and document it in what would become essentially the, a modern day messianic Torah observer in Israel Talmud of some sort, meaning a place of understanding of the rulings. Because all the Talmud was, right or wrong, I'm not endorsing it or, dis, or, or against it, was the, written, the writing down of these kind of halachic discussions. And just so you know, sometimes they didn't actually come up with a ruling. All you got to hear was the discussions. And sometimes they did make a ruling and they explained why. Okay, But I don't want you to think it's all rulings in there. Sometimes you hear them discussing a bunch of stuff and they never really come up with a, an agreed to answer. And so, so when you look at this today, so then what do we do with things like transfusions? And what do we do with transplants or organs? And so there are Hebraic and Jewish precedents to understand the idea of saving a life. Okay? Things that you would do to save a life as opposed to in, so where the Torah is concerned. So you can receive blood. This is not eating blood. So transfusion is not eating blood. Eating blood is something people do. I mean, there are people still today in, 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 in sort of those 
out, out more in the, in, the, um, in the wild, so to speak, I guess, in the, like in the Australia, in the outback, or in other places in South and Central, where they, 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 they kill things with spears and things, and you'll see them puncture an animal and go and pour, get, you know, gather some of the blood from the side of the animal, they'll drink it. Okay, they, will, they still do this today in some places. And so this is much more common back in, in Yeshua's day and all the way back into Moses' day. And in Moses' day and Yeshua's day, they did this as part of their pagan sacrifices where they would slaughter the animal and gather its blood and then drink it. That's the eating, ingesting of the blood. Okay? Now you're digesting and ingesting blood as opposed to a transfusion that's been purified and been screened and you're getting just that specific part of it so you can stay alive. Okay? So my, uh, through the MTY leadership, the, and again, the way that leadership works, we talk about things, everybody shares their opinion, but the burden of responsibility to make the decision falls on me. I'm the Nasi. Nasi would mean the same as the president of the uh, Sanhedrin was known as the Nasi, the head of the Sanhedrin, okay? So it's the presiding leader of the bigger group of leaders. And so as the Nasi of MTY, it, it falls on me to make those decisions ultimately. But it also falls on me to bring consensus, in other words, to help bring agreement among the rest of the members to see why that ruling is the right ruling at this time. And we've never had a problem with that. We've had had some, some issues that came up that we didn't all agree on initially, but ultimately after making the ruling, everybody came to see that that was the best decision to make ultimately, okay, at that point. All right, um, so that takes care of that, and in transplants, the same thing. Okay, there's nothing strictly against that. Um, this is about, again, saving lives. We have some people here that are looking forward to some transplants, and we're glad they're gonna be able to get them if they get them, and it, it's, it's saving lives, and there's nothing halakhically against that. Hala, halakha in the Hebrew is, is your walk. Okay, so halakhic is things to do with the walk. That was a long-winded answer, but so you understand how things get handled. Now, these are things that now that we're doing them, we should be writing them down which we are, but we have to document them and then make them available eventually on the MTOI website as MTOI halakha interpretation, okay? And so then you can then go and look up these things, okay? And then we can have them in sections like, you know, issues of kashrut, issues of holy days, issues of Shabbat, and then you can just look them up. That's exactly the way the Talmud's broken up. Because you can go look at Tractate Shabbat, you can look at the, the, whole, the whole, the volume just on, actually I think it's more than one on Shabbat, and then you got the one on Holy Days, you got the ones on Temple Services, ones on everything. The 72 volumes. For those who think, oh I've read the Talmud, no you didn't. It takes up almost my whole wall bookcase. It's 72 volumes. The Babylonian Talmud, which is the, the primarily, primarily accepted Talmud, is 72 volumes. Okay, so anybody tells you they read it, they're not telling you the truth. And plus, I can show you one of them and open it up. Unless they know Aramaic and they know Hebrew, they're not gonna understand anything in it anyway. It's not written for you to understand in English. Even though there is English in some of the volumes of translations, but it's written with the commentaries, it's got Rashi, it's got the Targums, it's got all kinds of things all on one page, and it's not simple to learn without instruction and how to understand it. So I know there's a lot of people out there who attack the Talmud. I promise you almost none of them have ever read it. Okay, they read something that somebody posted on the internet who read something that someone posted on the internet 15 times back and who knows where the original source of it was. Okay? But they did not read it. All right. And if you hear at some point, if you wanted to see, you know, I could take, well, when you see me do the zones and I do the zone, usually from my office, zone, zone uh, three usually, you could see it on the wall behind me. It's the whole bottom shelf of the bookcase behind me. Okay, the wall, the wall bookcase. All right, next question. All right, there are questions that don't have to do with the walk. Do you want me to skip sure. those or move through? No, we could, we could try those. Okay. In Exodus 16, verses 23 and 24, it says that manna left over for Shabbat did, didn't have worms. Does this imply that it was uncooked manna or is there another explanation? No, so, so what he did with this miracle, right, of providing food, this manna, and, and the Hebrew word manna is, is really just a conjunction of two words, which means what's this? Okay, ma is what, so mana is what's this? <laughs> they, so that when you say something and you go, oh, it's a whatchamacallit. Well, that's what they said, we didn't know what it was, it was what's this? So they were eating a bunch of what's this? 
and, and so they were still to cook. It says, bake what you bake, cook what you cook in that area. It says, and then it won't spoil, it'll hold. So you can have it for Shabbat, your double portion. So that was also part of the way it was designed in the miracle of the, of the manna. All right? So it wasn't that they didn't cook it, because if that was the case, they would have just not cooked it and saved it over on a Monday or a Tuesday, and it would have been fine. But that wasn't the case. Anything they kept over, okay, on, I mean, for Shabbat, would have been no good, unless it was for Shabbat. I mean, they said, this you, but don't gather. Okay? You have to not gather. He said, I don't want you gathering. I want you to have for the day what you have for the day. And you trust me to give you your daily bread. That's kind of why we get the daily bread verse. Trust Abba for the daily bread. Okay? So it wasn't like if they just figured out, well, just don't cook it. It'll be, it'll be fine. No. Okay? You are to trust him every day and have a double blessing. By the way, that's why they had to prepare on the preparation day. They had to go get their food and gather a double portion and prepare it. So they'd have it already ready for Saturday. Okay? All right. What else? Okay. So do I need to explain to my family, parents and siblings, about why I'm not attending their Saturday events? I've just been saying I'm busy that day. Am I being a coward? I'm not here to tell you what you should or shouldn't tell your parents. And the answer to the coward question is very simple. It's, it all comes down to why you're not telling them. It sounds to me like you're being a coward because the way you're wording it sounds like you're afraid to tell them, so you're avoiding it, which means that you're acting in a cowardly way. As opposed to just saying, I'm, I, I'm very comfortable to tell them, but I don't want to disturb their peace if I don't have to, so I'm choosing a different way. So you see what I'm saying? So really the motivator is what what's, decides whether it's cowardly or not. All right? Um, I mean, you don't have to explain to your parents anything necessarily. I think that it's reasonable to do that. I think that if you really want your witness to be correct, if you want them to, to respect and stop asking you to do things, because you can't just be busy every time that they ask you. <laughs> I mean, I guess you could if it's like once a year they ask you, but I mean, if this is something that happens all the time, at some point they're gonna look at you like, what's going on? And so, you know, it's so funny. You guys came out of Christianity. I don't know if this person did, but a lot of you came out of Christianity where you were probably encouraged to, even if you didn't do it, go out and bother everybody with your witness, and now you're afraid to witness. I don't get it. Because I'm not talking witnessing like you did in Christianity. Live your life openly, and that's your witness. Well, you know, we want to invite you over for the family barbecue on Saturday, and, and by the way, we're going to like, you know, play horseshoes in the back and we're going to do this and that or whatever in the backyard and you say I'm sorry it's Sabbath I'm witnessing right I, I can't do that you guys can do what you want I keep Saturday Shabbat and I can't do that on Shabbat I'd be happy to do that on Sunday if you want or whatever other day that's a witness it also will get them to yell at you and argue and give you all kinds of grief and don't you know that was nailed to the cross and blah 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 well then you get to witness some more and say well actually mom dad that's not really what it says there I don't believe that's actually what it says but see, now that's where the fear comes in, and that's where you actually can fall into the coward category. I mean, you don't have to be aggressive about it. You can be as gentle as you can. Just, just say, listen, I appreciate that you want me to come over. I don't want to cause any problems. But just so you know, for future, I won't be able to do anything like that on Saturday. If you go to invite me, just know I can't do it. Be upfront. Be honest. Let them know. Okay. All right, next question. Um, since I've come under your covering and have submitted to your authority, should I cease wearing tzitzit? And this is from a Mazzy Hill, so I'm just female. Okay. This is not a question that's ever caused me any problems in the past. <laughs> Those who know are laughing very hard. Um, look, this is from my right ruling, again, Deuteronomy 17 type stuff. Tzitzit are one of those instructions that is murky. What I mean by that? In Numbers 15, where the instruction is to wear the seed seed, it says, speak unto the children of Israel. It says, B'nai Yisrael. B'nai Yisrael could be, speak to the men of Israel. Or it could be, you know, as far as it could be the boys, it could be the children of the men. Because you could take a group of women, okay? Five of them, a thousand of them, it doesn't matter. As soon as you stick one man in there, you're going to use the male 
to describe the group, okay? So it's not clear that this is a group of everybody or just the men. Scripture, I'm gonna make my case for how I address it and where it's coming from. Let me start off so I can ease your mind as to how I address it. I don't believe scripture gives us any instruction that the women need to wear them. I also don't believe there's any instruction saying they shouldn't wear them, okay? Possibly in Deuteronomy where it says that women should not wear that which pertains to a man might be talking about that because in that same chapter it also talks about wearing seat seat. A few verses later it talks about don't forget to wear your seat seat. So but we're not really clear on what it means pertaining to a man. Is it talking about armor and weapons? Is it talking about seat seat? What is it talking about? It doesn't say, all right? So there's no overtly obvious thou shalt not, okay, for the women in the seat seat. So I do not require or insist or even encourage women not to wear them. I also don't encourage them or insist that they do wear them, which is part of what got some people mad at me over the years because they thought I should insist that the women, women wear them. From historical precedent, from the Jewish community, yes, there, are, there have been times where some of the Jews have had some of the women wearing them, but almost, I mean, we're talking about it's like the, the unicorn, right? That's not the average thing that generally happens. Those are the rare exceptions, okay? And so I don't see that play out generally in, in, um, in history where the women wore them. The seat seat were to remind us to keep the commandments, okay? It's like the original string around the finger, like something to remind you, like, now don't forget to do something. Well, you have to wear them on your garment to remember to keep the commandments. And by the way, they should be where they're visible, Okay, so you can see mine. I got mine right here, okay? They should be outside where people can see them. And I know there are people out there that claim that they're wearing them underneath and everything else, but who knows you're wearing them then? You can't see them. I can't see them. It's not helping anybody. Oh, but I know they're there. If they're there, I don't believe some of the people. Okay, especially if they're in leadership and you should be showing everybody by example that you're wearing them. Nobody should be doubting that I'm wearing seat seat. okay? <laughs> Nobody should be wondering, wondering and guessing, I don't know, is he wearing, because I'll tell you what, when I watch people teach, and I, like I said, I watch, on a, I've said this before, I watch on a regular basis different teachers to see where they're at. One of the first things my eyes do is look for the seat seat. This person who's supposedly an expert in teaching some sort of Bible-based, Torah-based, halachic thing, if that's what they're claiming to be, I want to know they're wearing their seat seat. And more often than not, they're not. And so you will always see mine. I make them long enough that even though I wear my shirts untucked, you will see it longer than the shirt. You will know I'm wearing the seat seat. Okay, there's never going to be a question about that. So that being said, let me kind of get to my reasoning. So we do have in, in Scripture the understanding that all Scripture is written to the men. I didn't say it wasn't for the ladies. The men were the head, the, everything was passed down vertically. So the leadership then gave it to the men and the men then gave it to the women and children. So all instruction, first and foremost, is for men. Unless, of course, it's one of those instructions that is actually for women, which it actually will say that this is for women, okay? And there are a lot of commandments that are just for the women. Now, some of them are obvious because there's things that women experience that men don't experience, and it has those things that they would be dealing with, okay? Men don't have that monthly cycle to deal with and things like that. So there's Torah laws about those kinds of things. Torah laws about giving birth. Men don't give birth. Sometimes they whine like they are, but they don't give birth. That made Elder Billy laugh really good. We get him on the phone, and I said, hey, what, are you pregnant? I mean, you just, they sound like they're, you know, some of these guys, I don't know. Anyway. So, so there, isn't, there isn't anything that we should be taking from Scripture except to know that first and foremost, these things are given to men. So if it's, for, if it's for everybody, it's at least for the men. Okay, if something's for everybody, it's for sure for the men. Okay? And so when you're asking the question about the covering, so what we've said in the past was, if it's for the men, it's so that everybody can see it outside on you, which is why you wear them on the corners, so to speak, so people see them when they're behind you and when they're at the side and when they're in front of you, they can see your seat seat. All right, they should be visible to everybody where they can see them. Now, I wear my seat seat really very unselfishly, really for you. And you wear yours for me. In other words, I can't see these 
I have to look down, I have to, you know, I can't really see them as easily as while I'm looking at you. My peripheral vision can pick up your seat seat pretty easily. Okay? Not a problem. And so if the community men are wearing their seat seat, everybody can look and be reminded about Torah all the time. And if the man of the house is wearing his seat seat, the ladies and the children are seeing that. And so if you are covered, in other words, you have a husband or you have someone like me as you're covering, and I'm wearing them, then yes, you would not necessarily need to wear yours, I would say, to a woman, okay? Of course, if you're only seeing me once a week on the screen, that doesn't quite help you all day long every day. So I don't know the best answer for you except to say, allow you to prayerfully consider what you should be doing with it, and then you could even talk to me about it if you want to ask me about what you feel like your answer was. I will not stop you. I will also not insist that you do it for the ladies, okay? For the guys, I don't make you do it either, but I'll get in your face from the microphone every now and then. But if you're not wearing them, you will never have me come up to you and say, wear your seat seat. I may say that if you start to give me grief about something halakhically, and I'll tell you that your lack of seat seat is really making it hard for me to hear, you know, what you're saying. But otherwise, I don't, I don't go and bother anybody. That's their walk. Remember, covenant's between you and him, not between you and me. So I'm not going to get involved in all that, okay? So as far as the ladies wearing them, now what I will say is this. If you are going to wear a seat seat, let's do it halakhically according to tradition. And I'll give you my reasons why I agree with this. Let's make them white with one thread of blue. Let's not make them green and yellow and red and orange and everything else, okay? It's not an accessory. It doesn't need to match your outfit or your shoes or whatever, Okay, I've often said, this may sound a little gross, but I don't care if Abe told me to make them puke brown and green, I'm being blunt, I would wear them with every pair of anything I was wearing. I don't care what color they are. Okay, I wear them for obedience. There was a lady once that had wanted to put on our website, this is many, many years ago, um, wanted to link that she had seat seat that she made. And her, her business was called uh, bling your fringe. And I emailed her back, I guess it was Facebook, and I, I Facebooked her back and I said, I think you and I are wearing them for, the, for totally different reasons. Because I would never think of them as bling. And she had put crystals in them and you know, other beads and things and stuff to make them jewelry, basically. And I'm sure they were pretty enough and stuff, but they were not seat seat. Okay, seat seat are to teach you and remind you. So what does it teach you? So you have white strings. Now, when they originally made the seat seat, let's assume they made them out of white wool from the, from the animals. Is the white wool from the animals purely perfectly white? Never, okay? Slightly off in different places. I mean, even if it's unblemished, it's still not gonna be just perfect white. They'd have to bleach it in some way to really get it to be white. So let's say you have this white, wool thread, okay, because they generally would make them out of wool. And then you have this blue techelet thread that you wrap around it. What does the blue thread represent? Okay, Messiah, okay? Even the Jews think of it that way. And so think of the imagery of this imperfect, possibly stained looking off-white thread wrapped around and covered by Messiah. You see the picture? That is us. Okay? You can't get that with orange and green and all the other rainbow colors you want to put on there. Although people have told me that the, the colors they chose are very meaningful and they're, I don't care. And by the way, I'm sure he doesn't either because now it's about you and not about him. Oh, but I chose them because of my thing with him. No, you chose it because it's what you wanted. And you inserted that to him. Now, people will say to me, I'll say to them, well, why do you make them all these different colors? Well, they'll say because the scripture says I can. And there's a lot of ministries out there with videos that teach exactly that. Prominent ministries that teach that it says that you have to make one blue and you can do whatever you want with the other ones. Let's go to Peshat, Ramez, and Drash, and So. Peshat, this is what we call pardes, or the four levels of interpretation of Scripture. That's not a scriptural thing, by the way. It's something the Jews came up with over the centuries. And I can see where it makes sense that the Scripture is written on at least four levels. 
Peshat being the simple, straightforward, literal. It is what it says, right? The remez being the hinted at, okay? The drash being the allegorical, like through the story, and then the uh, sod or the, the uh, hidden. Now, one of the rules of interpretation is that you can't go towards remez, drash, and sod so far that it no longer looks like the peshat. The peshat should always be clear, even at the hidden level, because the peshat is the straightforward what he actually is saying, okay? So, so what does he actually say in Numbers 15? He says that you are to make them in the four corners of your, in the corners of your garment, and you are to wrap them or have put one in them a thread of blue. And it's not just blue, it's techelet, which is a specific color. All right, techelet. And my seed seed are actually made with what they understand to be the actual blue from Israel. The Orthodox are now making these. They're a little bit more expensive to buy the string, and you have to make them yourself. But the, it has what they believe is the dye that makes the techelet color. Okay? Now, the, the instruction doesn't tell you what to do. Theoretically, it doesn't. I think it absolutely does. What to do with the other th strings. First of all, it doesn't tell you how many to use. That's nothing, there's no instruction that says what they look like. Do you understand that? So even everybody out there blinging their fringe is still tying them almost all exactly like the Jews do. They're just adding other things to them. So I, I look at them like they say, well, I don't have to do what the Jews do. I said, then why do you tie them that way? Why do you use that number of strings? Why don't you just randomly do whatever you want to do? Because you're doing it exactly the way the Jews have for thousands of years. So why are, why are you doing it that way? And so here's why we, what I choose. Okay, the Peshat says when you make your seat seat, don't do anything. It doesn't tell you to do anything to the other strings. It just tells you to dye one of them to chelet. So the peshat would be to leave the other ones alone, not to do whatever you want with them. Do you understand how much more simple and straightforward that is? Plus, we can go to the local artsy whatever store, right, art supplies type place, and you can get any color string you want. I mean, every shade of every color, and it's not even that expensive to do. It was expensive to dye things a color in Yeshua's day, in Moses' day. Do you know there was a lady that's named Lydia in scripture? Was she wealthy? Yes. Why was she wealthy? Because she was a seller of purple. She dyed things purple. and pur That was expensive stuff. Okay? And so this was taking something very valuable, making one string this expensive dye, this techelet. You know, one of the reasons why the Jews stopped using the techelet, and they really did for a long time, is because it was too costly for everybody to afford it. That was their opinion. And so they just went with white for a long time. When I was growing up, you know, through mo almost all of my youth, you know, all of the Jews in my community only wore white. Most of them still only wear white. But now there is this quote unquote rediscovery of the process of making the techelet. And they're making it fairly affordable. It used to be about $80 for a set of strings. Now it's closer to 50. So it's come down quite a bit, okay? You can get them from Israel. It's like techelet, I think it's techelet.com dot something or whatever. And, and you, can, you can order the strings. The, the, they do come in different thicknesses and different designs for different ways of tying them so they have different lengths of the string. So you may want to ask me which ones I use and which ones. I think it's the, the Rambam thick ones that I get anyway, but it's seven strings. But they also make them with eight and other different configurations, how they do it. Now, those are the traditions. So then the last part that I want to give you on this, so make them white with blue. Okay, I'm not saying you have to go to Israel and get the techelet, but I think, you know what? Why wouldn't you invest in a good set of seat seat? Now, if you wear them for work and they're going to get all destroyed, then use like the cheaper ones you can get from us and that's fine. But for Sabbath, have a nice set that you wear all the time, uh, only on Sabbath. And they'll last you a year, two, three, for, you know, that same $50 to have a nice set of seat seat. Okay? Only thing is, like I said, the string comes without tying them, so if you don't know how to tie them, you'll have to get somebody to tie them for you. Okay? That's usually how Shamash Waffle gets his done. <laughs> he gets a string for me, and then he gets Shearer or somebody to make them for him. <laughs> so, did I make your last set? 
No, I made it for somebody else that had gotten it for me. Somebody else had asked me and I made him a set. Okay, but the thing is you have to, you know, we do have a workshop online where you can learn how to make them yourself. Okay, um, so the, but the last part of this is, you know, we are told that there will not depart from between the feet of Judah, the lawgiver, a lawgiver, a teacher of the law. So really it's the idea of a teacher of the law, which means that the oracles were given to Judah. The, the teacher, it says that these are all scriptural verses you're aware of, that the oracles were given to Judah. The teacher of the law would come from Judah. And so when we don't really know what else to do, probably makes sense to see what Judah's doing. That doesn't mean they're right about everything. Certainly they're not. But wouldn't hurt to go see, well, how do you do this, especially when we don't know? Because if you read Numbers 15, okay, let's just look at it real quickly. Numbers 15, I mean, it just very simply says, and starting in verse 38, speak to children of Israel and tell them to make tzitzit on the corners of the garments throughout the generation to put a blue cord in the seat seat of the corners. That's your whole instruction. Doesn't tell you anything else. What it looks like, how to attach them, are there how many strings, what, doesn't tell you anything. Yet Judah's been doing it the same way forever. Slightly different variations between say a Sephardi or an Ashkenazi, etc. But we're talking about slightly different. Same white, possibly with a blue, just the way they wrap them, it's a little bit different. Okay? Okay, so um, the one group, by the way, does it the way I do, which is to, to wrap it with 10, 5, 6, 5, which is the Hebrew num- uh, gematria, the number count for yud heh vav heh. And so you're wearing actually Yahweh's name in your seat seat in the number of wraps. Okay. The other group does it more when you count the wraps and, and the knots and do some weird math, math, math and stuff. You end up with 613. Okay, this times this plus this or whatever comes out to 613. Okay, and that's their way of representing Torah. Okay, in their seat seat. And so, out of respect, I'm not saying that we bow down and kiss feet, but out of respect for our brothers in the Jewish community, they will certainly recognize and understand what you're wearing if you're wearing white with blue. They will look at you sideways if you're wearing rainbow colored stuff. They won't even know it's seat necessarily. Okay? So let's wear the white with the blue. Okay, that was a long-winded answer, but hopefully it makes some sense and answers the question. All right, next. Well, a couple of short ones on the seat seat. Um, okay, where'd it go? Oh, I have a job that requires me to tuck my seat seat for safety reasons, is that okay? Yes, okay, so I should have mentioned that. So when you're wearing your seat seat openly, there are going to be certain circumstances where you can't do that because it actually is a safety issue. Okay, you may work with mach- equipment and machinery where you can't wear anything loose on your, on your body because it could get caught in the machine and then the next thing you are in trouble, the machine's in trouble, all kinds of things like that. So yes, you would wear them tucked in. There's also the problem if you have to wear a uniform. Okay, so then when you go to work and you have to wear a uniform, and by the way, I've had police officers get permission to wear them. I've had uh, police detectives get permission to wear them. Postal workers, a little tougher, but it depends on where you are, what, you, what, what office you work at, what state. They may let you wear them. You always should ask. But if you can't wear them for your job out, outside because it's a uniform thing or a safety thing, then wear them inside until you're done working. Then wear them back outside. Okay, I don't wear them at the gym because I'm not wearing really clothes that makes it easy to attach them to. And I don't want them to get caught in any equipment or anything that I'm using there. I don't wear them when I swim. Okay, so you're not going to wear them under certain circumstances. But you're, when, when you're wearing just everyday interactive working and functioning clothing, you would wear them because you're going to want to be reminded of the Torah. All right. And so that's something that you can easily do. Okay. All right. Any other question on that? All right. Are we required to make our own seat seat? Am I not supposed to buy them pre-made? No. You can buy them pre-made. Um, I think it'd be great if everybody learned how to make their own because we're selling a lot of them and can't keep up. And some very unfortunate or lucky person or whatever you want to call it got four of them made by me recently because we ran out and I made them. Okay? That's why I said unfortunate or fortunate, depending if you think that's good or bad. But... Um, I used to make all of them, and then my wife was making them with me back years ago, and uh, now we have some other people that are making them, which is great, but, uh, 
you know, the demand for them has gotten very high. So I think it'd be great if you would learn how to do it. And like I said, we have a video that teaches you, you know, where you can get the string from that we use, you can, you know, how to, what length to cut it, and shows you literally how to make the, the seed seed, okay? We have kits here that are already pre-cut that you can order, and it's got one set of 10 wrapped set, you know, starting on one of them, so one started. But you certainly should, I think it'd be great if everybody would learn how to do it. We used to do a clinic at the feast, okay? Maybe we'll do that again at some point. We haven't done that for years. And, and, and somebody's clapping. So we could do it at the feast. The thing is, I, I, I like to do them what I, on what I call a, a CT board that I, I made, okay? Which is like a, a heavy piece of tile with a block of wood at the end of it with some dowels in it that gives you the loop that you can make. And so... I just don't have un enough boards really for everybody to do this, but I'm sure we can make new boards and then have enough. So how many of you would be interested in a CTC clinic at the next feast? Oh, that's a lot of hands. So maybe we'll have to do something like that and work that in there. Okay, but no, you don't have to. I think it'd be great if you learned to. I think you, every, look, as an Israelite, you should be able to make your own stuff, don't you think? And if you need seat seat as part of what you need, then you should be able to make them. All right, next. All right, so the question is, if these seats were commanded to be worn to help us remember to guard the commands, then does the helper in John 14, 25 and 26 relate in the same way to help remind us all that, of all that Yeshua did? Okay. Um, different, similar, I guess, in some ways. The helper that we're talking about in John is Yeshua himself coming as the spirit of truth. Uh, I've explained this in other teaching. I'm not going to explain it here. Um, go listen to the Father and the Son teaching and listen to Understanding the Ruach so you can understand that we're not talking about a third entity here or a trinity, but an element um, that actually has Yeshua then being that spirit of truth in you. He says in, in, in that chapter, I will not leave you orphans, I will come to you. He's talking about himself there. And yes, the, that Ruach is supposed to bring to remembrance all that he taught us and the law was given by him, so that's part of what he teaches us. So we have multiple ways to be remembering through the Ruach and through the Tzitzit, okay? One is intangible, the spirit, and the other is more tangible in the strings to help us combine. It may be that most of us probably don't think often enough to just go ahead and grab for those Tzitzit so when we're having a problem to think, all right, what does the Torah really say about that? But the Ruach may stir you to remember to think to grab your Tzitzit and think about that. Okay, so now you got them working together, okay? Where it was, you're so distracted, heading in almost the wrong direction, the rock grabs a hold of you, you think about your seats and saying, wait a minute, I'm wearing these, I can't go and do that dumb thing I was about to do because that's gonna embarrass Yahweh and it's not appropriate. All right, next. Last seat seat question, it's a combination of two. So it starts off, um, archeological records indicate that the Israelites wore fringes around the edges of their garments versus their corners. Also, the word can be translated edges, what is correct. And part of that, the Syrian obelisk in the British Museum shows Israelites with fringes around all the edges of their garments. Could what we do now be a post-Babylonian interpretation of the lost original tzitzit? Okay, so um, there is, there is, I've heard this before, so I'm not, this is not unusual. Um, we actually had a lady who was part of our congregation going back many, many years. Uh, that had these beliefs. Um, the indication when we talk about the corners, just like it also talks about the four corners of the earth, it talks about different things. It's giving you the idea, it, it has this idea of four, so that we see in all directions, okay, these are, these are indicators there. And so I only can go with what Judah's been doing. It could be post-Babylonian. And there are other images that we see that could be who knows whatever it's going to be. People did wear things on their garments to indicate their tribes, to indicate their, where they were in societally. There was all kinds of things that people had as far as uh, connected with their clothing that would give people who look at you a very clear picture quickly of what your status was on some form or another. And so I don't know how that would have looked back then. I, I'm just saying that this is what we have. And we do have the idea of it being the, something that um, would have been, it seems to me, corners and four. Because the garment would have had the four corners, okay, because really it was a piece of cloth that they would wear as they wore layers of cloth. And it would have been a cloth that they either wore over their shoulders or more likely had a hole to put your head through. And when it lay in the front and it lay in the back, the corners would actually be on the side, 
which is why my seat seat, well, I'm trying to make sure on the camera, see my seat seat right here on the side. Okay, here's one, and here's the, here's the other one. All right, there, okay? So they're on the side. Because that's where the garment would actually sit, where the corners would be, okay? They wouldn't be way up in front or way in the back where you'd be sitting on them, whatever, but it'd be more on the hip to the side. But you can still see them from the front and from the back and from the side. I just think that's where it would be. So is it possible what you're talking about? I haven't seen that argument in about 20 years, so I, I'm not remembering the argument that she made many, many years ago, but um, I'm, I'm of the belief that this is what we should be doing today. Okay, next. All right, um, let's see. John 19, verses 25 and 27. Why did Yeshua give his mother to John? Yeshua had brothers who maybe should have taken care of, her mother, of their mother. John 19, what verse? 25 and 27. Okay, so this, this is, again, a typical way of communicating to us the difference between family by choice and family by birth. Okay? And so this is his bringing or giving over the caretaking to somebody family by choice. Okay? Now look, Yeshua had you know, those that, that, that could have been you know, uh, there to do, do those kind of things, and he chose what he chose. Um, I just trust that he chose what he chose because that's what he wanted to do. But as far as it being blood siblings... You know, blood siblings, how many blood siblings do you have that actually are walking this out? Or parents that are walking this out? Or children that are walking this out? Or, most of us don't. It's a big blessing because we do have some people here that have more than one generation family together, okay? And I mean together, not including little ones who really have not made a choice yet, but who are old enough to make choices and that more than one generation that are still on the same, on the same walk. Okay, next. All right. Uh...